Welcome everyone to this panel uh, on Built Heritage and Climate Adaptation uh, organized as part of the International Conference Climate, Culture and Peace. So for last few days you have been listening to very interesting panels and uh, other kind of uh, events. And this event, uh, this panel is focused on Built Heritage. Now when we focus on Built Heritage, the scope of it can really range a lot. It can be monuments, archaeological sites, historic buildings vernacular housing, historic settlements and cultural landscapes. Uh, though tangible in their manifestation, these are inherently linked to intangible aspects such as traditional crafts and cultural practices. More so, link of built heritage with culture or with sorry with nature uh, cannot be overlooked as these have evolved in response to the local environmental context. Now, unfortunately, this environmental context has been undergoing an unprecedented change, posing risks to built heritage from various factors ranging from climate related disasters such as hurricanes and floods, as well as cumulative factors uh, such as change temperature, humidity conditions and increased rate of erosion. As a result, the same the very same traditional materials and structures that evolved in response to local climate are no longer able to cope with extreme changes, necessitating increased focus on adaptation of built heritage as well as conservation and management practices to this new reality. While we struggle to cope with climate change impact, built heritage has also been a victim of increased human induced disasters and conflicts. And it can be safely mentioned that climate change directly and indirectly exacerbates conflicts due to depletion of resources and safety nets. However, recovery from conflicts and disasters also provides an opportunity not only to restore lost or damaged historic values, but also to build back better by integrating climate adaptation in the recovery process. Uh, last but not the least, it would not be wrong to always project, uh, it would be actually wrong to always project built heritage as a victim of climate change and conflicts. Built heritage can actually also contribute towards climate adaptation through tremendous wealth of traditional knowledge on building, maintenance and monitoring. Of course, this knowledge is not static. It has evolved through changing context and we need to ensure that it continues to evolve through innovative conservation and management practices that respond to accelerated processes of climate change. In this panel, we will explore the current understandings on these issues and also explore new approaches, focus areas for further research and practice. And I'm delighted to introduce you in this panel to our presenters and discussants who are going to really enrich the discussion, I'm sure, about it. Uh, may I request all our discussants and presenters to kindly open their cameras and just say very brief hello to everyone so you can all at least see them. I'll be introducing them uh, briefly before their interventions. Now, without further ado, let's start uh, with our four presentations, following which I will request our discussants to make their reflections and uh, I will also request the presenters now to limit their interventions to 10 minutes, please, so that we can have enough time to take questions and comments from the floor. So let me introduce the first uh, two presenters who are going to jointly present. Uh, I'm very delighted to, uh, to have uh, with, uh, with me uh, Mr. Thierry Joffroy, uh, who is an architect specialized in urban architecture. Since 1986, he has participated in the teachings of the uh, post master's degree uh, of specialization in urban architecture at Krater uh, in Grenoble uh, before taking the responsibility for its scientific direction. In parallel, he has participated in many action research works around the world, bringing his expertise for the elaboration and implementation of various projects and programs on the theme of architecture, heritage and sustainable development. So welcome Thierry. 
I am also uh, welcoming David uh, Gandrio, who is an archaeologist, uh, PhD in architecture, researcher at the National School of Architecture at Grenoble. He specializes in urban cultural heritage studies, conservation and valorization, and has carried out numerous missions of expertise and training, in particular on world heritage sites in the Middle East, Central Asia, and in Africa, with focus on archaeological sites. So we have really very experienced two professionals here. So I invite you to kindly share your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ray. Did, do you do it? Yes. Hear us? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you and we okay. can see your presentation. Thank you very so, much. So uh, the title of our presentation is Learning from Heritage for Better Resilience. And uh, what we want to present is how did we come to that as a, as a crater, which is the International Center for Orphan uh, Architecture. So the, the, I, th I think our history is, imp is important to, 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 to recall uh, on that. And uh, so, so the, the most important thing for us is that we were born in our region here. And we were born because we found here uh, uh, numerous heritage, local heritage, simple or, 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 or a bit more elaborated, built with earth. And, and the, the, the thing was that uh, a group of students in the 70s found that and, and said, huh, we can work with, with what we have under our feet. It's, it's excellent. It's, it's, it has a lot of potential. So let's explore that. And in the 1970s uh, was the first oil and the first and second oil crisis. And everybody was started to look for uh, alternatives to, to, to uh, more frugal alternatives. So the, the idea has always been to inspire from heritage towards uh, contemporary contemporary architectural production uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, the, the and, and we had the chance by that time the, la the launch uh, and to participate to, uh, to large projects uh, in France but elsewhere in, in the world we have some pictures here of the Domaine de la Terre which was built in 1983 1985 64 uh, houses built with earth and, and the large projects uh, which came uh, later on to uh, 20,000 uh, houses being built in the, in the island of Mayotte. Uh, so all this beginning was in 1979. Uh, Prater was created as an NGO, gathering together students and teachers from the uh, School of Architecture in Grenoble. There are also professionals from the field from Belgium, Algeria, Peru, Burkina Faso. Uh, and, <clears throat> and, and, and the first uh, uh, strong activity was to publish this book, which is called Construire en Terre, Building with Earth, uh, which has been uh, distributed uh, uh, and, and has inspired many people uh, around the world. Uh, the team has, has evolved in a research laboratory in 1986 uh, as a research lab, but also with a postmaster in urban architecture, we, which we still have. And in 1998, uh, we had the we were given the responsibility to chair uh, to, to to pilot a UNESCO chair. We started with, with, uh, with an interest in heritage, but actually it's only in 1989 that we really went in heritage as such with collaboration with uh, ICROM and UNESCO, uh, more specifically on world heritage issues. Uh, <clears throat> there were at that time a lot of problems identified on, on this type of heritage and uh, uh, ICROM contacted us to, to, to see whether our expertise could be valorized also for conservation. So we, we had the opportunity to do some, some work and, and our expertise was also field work. And we did work in Tumbuktu, for example, but still keeping, uh, keeping some activity uh, in France. Uh, this finally led, not finally, but this led to uh, develop a large program in, uh, in Africa uh, in, in line with another project, which, which call, was called Prema Prevention in the Museum of Africa. And we, we launched with <coughs> Uh, and, and later on, UNESCO, a large program, Africa 2009, which lasted 10 years and was uh, <clears throat> both some exploration, but also training uh, of the uh, National Heritage Organization uh, in, uh, in conservation. Uh, but this led us to, 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 to identify a lot of specificities uh, in Africa. Uh, and and uh, we came out with a uh, lot of information on um, traditional conservation practices, which actually led to a, pub a specific publication, uh, which is something which still to me is, is really 
something extremely important which came out from his program in Africa 2009 and which sensitized us to, to, be, to the importance of the traditional practices in, in general, which, which afterwards I realized was, was also a reality in Europe, but, but in, in every continent. Another thing very important which came out of this Africa 2009 program was that it, it was difficult not to link uh, heritage and conservation of heritage to local development. So we started to develop more on, on this issue. <clears throat> so just a, a picture to, that illustrates what we are uh, looking for is uh, we have a tradition on the left and what from this can we uh, suggest uh, today uh, as a reinterpretation of, of traditions uh, responding to the, the new uh, uh, expectations of the populations. <clears throat> and uh, part of this was that uh, we, we had the opportunity to, to, to visit and to work in, in many uh, different uh, places, including places where uh, the ancient traditions are, are still very lively. And I'm showing here the examples of uh, Kutamaku. Kutamaku is in northern Togo, both in northern Togo and northern uh, Benin. And, and we discovered so many interesting things in, in these traditions on how people were uh, uh, <clears throat> choosing the place for locating the houses, uh, how they, uh, they, they, they were designing somehow the balance between uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the villages and nature around the materials we were using, all this was uh, looking so clever that, uh, and, and somehow uh, appeared to us like being uh, possibly very, uh, very uh, pertinent responses to the challenges of today of uh, 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 sustainable development. David. So thank you. Let me, to, to continue in line with what uh, Thierry has just said, what we are trying to, to do now is to organize our ideas, I would say. And uh, we realize that uh, there are many, many uh, things to learn from, uh, from this heritage. And they are, they are at various levels and scales. And uh, from the adaptation to the environment, the climate, and even moreover, the climate changes, uh, we are here for that, uh, up to uh, very intangible values associated with uh, building cultures. Uh, from what, from, where, from which we have a lot of knowledge to, to gain for to design contemporary architecture and um, also urbanism. So I will shortly illustrate this, uh, this idea with a, a project in which we are currently involved. It's in uh, Saudi, Arab, in Saudi uh, Arabia, in, um, in Alula, moreover. Uh, here we, we are learn, really learning the site from the archaeological uh, heritage. And uh, for example, in Dadan, uh, it's clear that there is a, a very strong uh, um, rational use of the local resource because the site, the site is built just uh, very close from the cliff from where the stone was, uh, was taken. And moreover, uh, after, after using the stone from the cliffs, uh, the Dadan people from uh, 2,500 uh, 2, years ago, used to, um, to dig their, their tomb there with uh, some rituals, which are also very interesting. Uh, in the same area, we're working on the, uh, for the old town of, uh, of Alula. And here from this vernacular architecture, we are learning a lot uh, again, about the adaptation of uh, the, the population there to the arid environment with the uh, uh, Oasis town system. Uh, and we are learning some clever bioclimatic principles from where we, we want, it will be the next phase, to, to redevelop some uh, modern architecture inspired from, um, from this, uh, this, um, this heritage, so archaeological and vernacular heritage in, um, in Alula. And I think Thierry Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> An example of what we, we can do using this kind of exploration of uh, tr traditional is, is the work we've, uh, we've been doing in, uh, in uh, Haiti. Uh, in 2010, there was a very uh, huge earthquake in Haiti, which has been very destructive. And we participated to some of the uh, early missions just after the earthquake. And, uh, and what quickly came to our, 
to, to <clears throat> came out of the of this exploration is that uh, the old traditional buildings uh, had behaved much better than, than the new ones uh, and uh, than the recent ones of the ones built with, uh, with uh, foreign um, uh, technologies. So we studied that and made some proposals on uh, how we could uh, build on these traditions and develop some, uh, some um, kind of modern uh, reinterpretation of these traditional uh, building uh, systems. So, <clears throat> so and we started to develop uh, some first prototypes and, uh, and uh, even we had some, re some negative reactions in the beginning. Finally, people uh, got very interested when they saw the first prototype. And, and, and this, uh, this uh, led to uh, many numerous uh, realization, uh, which uh, ended uh, after three years to 2,000 houses which, which had been rebuilt or repaired. Uh, we managed by that time to, to organize a, um, a, a research uh, linked to the, to the field project, uh, including a testing of a full size house on the shaking table, uh, which also gave some results, but also gave some measurements, which, which made it possible to give data to the engineers in charge and to the, to the, uh, to the responsibles of the government uh, and that helped a lot and, and finally uh, made it possible to, 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 to continue the process. Uh, what happened too is that after the, the 2010 earthquake, several typhoons uh, uh, passed by uh, IT, unfortunately. But what happened is that the houses we had uh, designed uh, to resist to the, to the seismic conditions also were also designed for, uh, for typhoons. And, uh, and, and, and they behaved well. So, so many organizations started to reuse what we, we had been doing. And this led to the development uh, together with the Red Cross and several partners uh, in, in, uh, in IT under what is called the shelter cluster, the national shelter cluster, uh, recommendations on how uh, people could continue this work with using the tradition as a base for developing uh, reconstruction projects or uh, construction of new houses. And this is based on this experience that we, we finally developed for many different uh, countries. I think we've done 10 now, uh, Fiji, uh, Republic of Congo. Uh, we, we are developing some uh, um, information uh, that can be used by uh, organization in charge of reconstruction projects so that they have information on uh, what is the traditional uh, uh, housing in in these countries, its variety, how it's how it's evolving in time, so that uh, at least uh, what is the best in these traditions will not be lost, uh, and we can reuse all all the best from these traditions. Whether it's uh, you saw the list uh, earlier that we are now trying to organize much better, but we have all this list, and, and uh, if you are interested by these documents, you can find them in the website, which is uh, down here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thierry. Thank you, uh, David, for this very, very enlightening presentation. Uh, uh, we'll get back to uh, the key points from your presentation, which uh, uh, we really need to discuss later on. So uh, I'll move uh, directly to the next speaker. Uh, and I'm very happy to invite uh, Mr. Aved uh, Al-Fadil Muhammad Ali, who is going to be speaking from Sudan all the way. And his uh, topic is environmental adaptation and socio-cultural mitigation approached in build form, uh, the case of vernacular Red Sea architecture at Swak in Sudan. So I'm going to share the presentation and uh, I will invite Ubaid to kindly make his speech. Uh, over to you, Ubaid. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahit. Very glad to join you in this great uh, conference. I hope that the voice is clear. Yes, it's all well. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm very glad, uh, first of all, to, to introduce uh, my home country, Sudan, and my affiliation, University of uh, Omdurman Islamic University, Faculty of Architecture. So, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the title of the presentation, it's about environmental adaptation and social cultural mitigation approach in built form, the case of vernacular Red Sea architecture at Sudan. Uh, could you please go next? Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, 
this uh, study is going th uh, to review all the uh, environmental adaptation techniques and the sort of social environment responding to the context that uh, took place in Sawakin, one of the main regions of Sudan. And uh, it also uh, shed the light, uh, highlights also on the uh, uh, how such kind of vernacular architecture could be reliable to depend on the uh, heritage and how this kind of heritage also can be uh, re responding to the context and also uh, having the ability to adapt with it. So basically we are going to review all of these techniques and uh, process and ways of uh, adaptation through residential buildings uh, as case studies, uh, three main uh, case study actually. And then through the visual analysis, we can uh, illustrate and demonstrate how all of these techniques have been applied. Uh, can you go to slide number five, please? Okay. Okay, very well. Uh, as you can see here, here in the illustration, it shows the, 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 the context or, or we can, or the situation. We can also uh, situate the problem and also we can uh, like introduce the, 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 the the area to which this study took place. Uh, as you can see, the IRL documentation, it's dated back to 1930 of Soakin. Uh, and lastly, and the, the, the picture above it is uh, representing our, uh, the, the, the main or the recent situation for Soakin right now. As you can see, there is a lot of deterioration happened. So this paper aims to explore the wisdom uh, that been used by the vernacular architecture of Sawakin, not only to uh, restore uh, the, the figurative aspect of this architecture, but mainly focused on the wisdom approach at that time in terms of the spatial allocation, in terms of responding to the context and the, so on. Uh, one of the main reasons why this, uh, uh, the inland of Sawakin gained its significance because uh, the, the, the oval shape, uh, for, for the oval shape distinctive uh, shape or place uh, for, for the, the, the island, island, uh, island itself. Uh, then the establishment of the new uh, harbor of Sawakin at 1991 uh, in a different place, uh, far away from the old town of Sawakin, has led, uh, has led to, to, the, to the state of the abandon, abandonment, which results in the deterioration that took place right now in Sawakin. Uh, can you go now to slide number seven, please? Yeah, yeah, that's it. As you can see here, uh, there is this uh, picture illustrate the main uh, typology or the main morphology of the Sawakin at that time. As you can see, uh, uh, the, 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 the narrow lanes, also the compacted, uh, dense uh, built up forms. Uh, this is the main characteristic of the built environment at, of Sawakin at that time. Uh, one of the main drive for, for, for taking this kind of morphology or built up uh, morphology, it's because the, uh, the demanding of privacy, because uh, one of the, uh, the main style, architectural style emerged in the, arch the architecture of Sawakin was uh, derived from the Othman style uh, and the Hijazi style, sorry, which is a very conservative. It's a highly demand on the term of privacy and so on. Uh, that's why they have been, uh, they applied like this kind of uh, narrow lane st uh, street and the dead end street also uh, in aim to circulate or to manage the, the, the circulation all around the city to minimize the work of the stranger. Also that the dense uh, built up uh, shape for the, for the building also because this kind of uh, privacy that required. And this is one of the first uh, social cultural uh, mitigation that applied in that architecture. Uh, the second uh, image here in this slide also shows some kind of, uh, or another kind of uh, social cultural mitigation, which is implied in the, the use of Roshan. As you can see, it's a kind of highly irrapolated windows. Uh, which is uh, which were used mainly as uh, um, um, derived or, or a matter of privacy, and then it was also adapted for an environmental uh, issues because it will act like uh, to to catch the air breeze and also to also uh, not not to 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 use the windows that it's already adapted or already uh, engaged with the uh, built form. So. so Okay, now you can go to slide number 12. Now we have already mentioned that uh, there are some kind of social cultural mitigation that 
been derived from the uh, social aspect. One of them was the privacy and also the, the, the use of the Roshan as a kind of windows within uh, this kind of architecture. Uh, moving to the uh, some case studies that we would like to highlight on in this presentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are just focusing on residential building because uh, Sawakin architecture is a non-monumental architecture. That's why it was uh, concerned with the residential building only. And also we would like to highlight three types of building as uh, to, to represent how the uh, functional or, or occupational function uh, was approached. Uh, mainly they, they have very interesting techniques we can uh, refer to in the another or, or in, the, in the upcoming slides. So go to the first case studies. As you can see here from the plan and the, 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 the the 3D that shows the building. Uh, we can see the first kind of a residential building at Sawakin. It's called the, lo the low laying house. It's just composed of ground floor. Uh, uh, as we can see here, uh, the kind of uh, separating the, the activities because most of Sawakin building were having that kind of uh, what is known the functional duality. All of the buildings there was allocating for residential and the commercial activities at the same uh, time within one uh, built up for. But here, as you can see, there is a kind of separation in terms of entrances, also in terms of uh, allocating all of these activities together. Uh, one of the interesting thing that uh, can, can, can be uh, linked to the ad environmental adaptation with this kind of, uh, this kind of architecture is as, as it is highlighted in the blue, is the interior courtyard, which is used horizontally to, to separate between the commercial and the uh, uh, private residential activities. Uh, I would like to mention, uh, to, to, to mention that uh, the use of uh, reception and this kind of commercial activities, because Sawakin was known for uh, being a uh, a route for trading and the pilgrims from all around Africa and from all around the world. That, that's why uh, this kind of cultural and social cultural uh, demand uh, has affected the way that they, 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 they used to design their buildings. So in this, uh, kind, uh, in this type, we can highlight that the interior courtyard is it, uh, the, the first environmental uh, adaptation used. Moving to the second one, it's a kind of uh, a mansion-like building. It's uh, a building not only composed of ground floor, it consists of uh, two to three floors. Uh, here we can notice that uh, the functional duality or the separation between the uh, public activities and the private activities was approached vertically, not horizontally like the first one. Uh, uh, as you can see in the ground floor, all the activities is just concerned with the reception and the, uh, uh, and the commercial activities while the uh, private activities all were located up. Uh, here, the environmental adaptation uh, in, in, in contrary to the courtyard that was approached in the low line, we can uh, notice here there is a roof, ter a roof terrace, which is uh, used, uh, which was used uh, to make like kind of seasonal variability. So here is like uh, another uh, use uh, within this building uh, between summer and winter because of this feature. Also the Roshan or the windows that we have spoke about it, uh, previously, here now it's representing like, and also formulating a second, a second project 10 facades. So the main using of these uh, features was not only concerned with the environmental and social, uh, social cultural, uh, uh, exclusively but also it it turns to some kind to a kind of aesthetical and to to be more uh, elaborated moving to the third case study it it shares the same tendency with the second one that we have okay made. can you wrap up in two minutes please thank you so okay. much okay go, go to sl uh, slide number 16 here a summary for all the uh, three case study that, that we have been talked to. Uh, as you can see, the dwelling type is different between them, clusterization, self-contained apartment, and quarter suit apartment in the third one. Uh, the kind of the key fe fact of feature 
for the environmental adaptation for the first one was the interior court and the second one, or the, the second and third one was the entrance and the staircase. Uh, also in terms of the built for expression, we can find like the, the, the low laying one is very limited while the second or the second type was a wide, wide range in terms of uh, having a second projecting facade and highly evaluated uh, highly uh, decorated decorations, while the third one was a moderate range or a medium range. To conclude, uh, all of these uh, case studies that we have been uh, going through, uh, going through uh, reveal the, the specialness of built form that was derived uh, basically from the social, social, social cultural aspect, uh, which is also reveal a kind of cross continuity between, uh, emerged within this style because uh, as we mentioned that uh, Sawakin gained a significance because, uh, because it's one of the uh, main uh, trade points in Sudan and in the, for, for the Red Sea uh, architecture or for the Red Sea uh, region for a whole. Also, we have been uh, talk about the occupational pattern and how it differs, how it uh, also the functional duality was approached either vertically or either uh, horizontally. Uh, in, in the future, uh, so this study uh, give a, a considerable, considerable emphasis on the residential vernacular architecture because we would like to restore such kind of wisdom in the foreseeable future in any restoration uh, schemes, as well the, the, the one that took place right now in Jeddah and uh, uh, and the one also that have been commissioned with the Turkish uh, government to, to be ap approached here in Sudan. Uh, thank you for listening and... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ubaid. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. I think there's a lot to learn from vernacular heritage with the first two presentations have brought this out uh, from very different contexts. And uh, what is equally important for us to understand is that climate adaptation is not in existing in isolation is so much embedded in so many other elements whether it's how people live how people really use their material so we need to kind of have a more holistic approach in looking at these where climate is an essential part of the larger uh, scheme of things to be looked at so uh, thank you again for your very interesting and uh, very uh, thought-provoking presentation and now uh, we move from Sudan to uh, uh, Lebanon and I'm very pleased to invite here uh, two distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, we have Ms. Alia Fares uh, and Ms. Grace Rihan Hanna. So Alia Fares is an archaeologist who has been also uh, recently an advisor at Landward Research delivering heritage management expertise in Lebanon. Uh, she has been directing uh, excavations with Lebanese Directorate General of Antiquities and German Archaeological Institute since 2003. Uh, also, she has been an um, archaeological consultant with uh, German Development Bank and is also doing her doctoral uh, studies at the moment. Uh, Grace Rihan Hanna is a restorer of architectural heritage. She is also one of the 40 Lebanese self-motivated architect restorers who launched emergency mission one day after the two explosions hit Beirut in, on August 4th, uh, 2020. Grace has graduated uh, with a distinction in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Architecture and has been a teaching instructor at Lebanese University. So uh, over to you, Alia and Grace, please. First, can you hear me loud and clear? Very well, very loud and very clear. Thank you. Can you see the presentation on full screen? Yes, very much. Thank you so All much. Right. So I will start. Thank you very much. Gratitude goes to the British Council, ICROM, and the moderators for giving us the chance to present Beirut's heritage after the explosion of August 4th, 2020. I'll start with an architectural overview of the city, followed by Mrs. Rihan Hanna's talk about the recovery process in the damaged areas, a process that turned, out, turned into a wake-up call reflecting on sustainability and climate-resilient heritage buildings. Beirut has metamorphosed itself repeatedly from an insignificant medieval town to a 1.5 million metropole between the Mediterranean and 2,000 meter high mountains in the back. Its heritage faced destruction for the past four decades. Our focus will be on the heritage starting the late Ottoman period 
around mid of the 19th century. From the 19th century map, a wall with seven gates can be seen, a sea castle, red tiled roofs, arcaded halls, and tightly connected streets. It was a typical medieval town up until the mid 1800s when the city expanded with a radical urban change. New social centers with traditional architecture and distinct urban features arose. By the 1920s, downtown Beirut lost its city walls. Towers were removed, citadels demolished, and streets rebuilt by colonial French boulevards, neoclassical squares, and clock towers. The humble Place des Canons became an enlarged martyr square. In 1975, a civil war struck, leading to 16 years of destruction, turning the center into a ghost town. In the 90s, the city center was reconstructed with a new soul, privatized for the rich, while most inhabitants were unable to rebuild, selling to investors. Other, other areas remained unharmed, untouched, becoming urban centers with their own heritage character, constructed with traditional climate adaptive features. Today, downtown Beirut has been turned into a concrete jungle, while other neighborhoods became heritage centers with a unique social fabric and climate resilient architecture, as the citad, as the circled red areas in the north are indicated in the map. I leave the floor for my partner and colleague, Grace. Grace, are you with us? Grace, are you with us? I think she might have um, thought that we are the fifth. I would suggest, uh, Alia, if you can go ahead with the presentation uh, so that we, we can continue, please. Just give me a second. Um, I'm opening her text. Until she shows up, I can go on. Yes, please. So, most of you know the shocking news of the double explosion that shook Beirut on August 4th, 2020, between 6.07 and 6.12 p.m., leaving more than 200 dead and thousands injured. We had been faced with many calamities before, like the earlier mentioned civil war, economic hardships, military attacks in 2006. But this time was different, with when huge amounts of ammonia nitrate stored unsafely at the port shook the entire city, an almost atomic-like experience which you can see in the images, the extent of. Entire buildings were in danger of collapsing any minute, especially traditional ones with wooden frames barely holding together with the Baghdadi roofs supporting triple arches. These were very fragile compared to modern concrete buildings, yet much more sustainable and adapted to the Mediterranean climatic fluctuations. So Lebanese heritage experts were compelled to quickly act to save the inhabitants of what was left of their buildings, especially those at risk. Therefore, Beirut Built Heritage Rescue 2020 initiative, a technical crisis unit was set up on August 6, just two days after, by volunteer heritage experts and restorers under the aegis of the General Directorate of Antiquities. A further equally serious problem to the danger of collapsing heritage buildings was that of the investors who offered owners financial rewards to sell their property, arguing, arguing that houses were at risk anyway, convincing them to sell. Therefore, the Ministry of Culture and the DGA issued a law number 194, freezing selling real estate transactions for two years, giving us time to reconstruct the city and to sustainably protect its historical monuments. Beirut's central hall homes may have taken decades of battering, but in their enduring beauty and resilience they share with the communities who inhabit them, they remind us why so many people remained in that city and worry deeply about its future. Please do keep in mind in the upper image, the Gulam cluster, the middle upper image, which we will see later how it was renovated after a year and a half of the blast. The affected area of Beirut is part of our collective memory. It has a high aesthetic, architectural, urban, social, and historical value, dating from the late Ottoman period till the French mandate. Walking through the streets, one can see the evolution of the architecture of traditional heritage buildings dating from 1860 to 1930, evolving towards modern heritage buildings, 
dating from 1930 to 1950. Each of the, the traditional houses has its own personality and is therefore distinct from, from one another. They nevertheless share an authentic family resemblance, which emerged from certain components common to the whole. The plan centered and organized around the courtyard or a central hall, the tripartite motive of the bay, on the main north elevation, the cubic form and the colors. The buildings are not isolated structures and the clusters of historic houses remaining in Beirut are rare. That is why they are very important. In Mar Mikhail and Jemezi districts have had public staircases as well, linking the port sector to Ashrafi for a century. These footpaths lead, lead directly to the steps of many houses. They are an integral part of the social urban fabric and fruit of history of the city and its expansion. The social fabric is part of this urban setting and generates strong economic activity in the area. Do we see Grace, by the way? Uh, yes, Grace I, I was there, but then she again uh, uh, had fallen out. So she's joining again. I think you can continue, uh, Alia, right. please. All right. The Bait Central Hall, or known as the Central Hall House, as of the mid of the 19th century, emerges as a modern type of house, which at present is referred to as the typical Lebanese house, with a central hall or the dar, with uh, three bays or a tilted house, has the appearance of a cube with triple arch base and covered with a roof of red tiles with four slopes. It is built in one or two Ramli limestone floors set in a private garden. If I can add, if I can add, Dalia, sorry, if I can, I can add that the, the yes, tile four Please slopes <laughs> was very adapted to our climate because of the, the for the winter season and for the summer season. It helps for the uh, humidity from the, you know, it was very helpful. Can you continue, please? Because I uh, I don't have a good internet connection. Sorry, I'm very okay. sorry. I will listen. Continue, all right. Alia. All right, all right. It is composed of several rooms that do not communicate with each other, arranged symmetrically on three sides around the dar, central hall, which serves as a reception area and distribution area. It is still, it remains the functional and decorative heart of the house, typically illuminated at one end by a splendid tripartite arcade, recognized as an authentic element of the Lebanese residential architecture. Facing north, open onto a narrow balcony made of marble slabs and iron railing. From the day two of the blast, Beirut Built Heritage Rescue 2020 have divided the region into red, orange, and green, and blue zones. Each zone was divided into parcels containing several lots. The team has been sorting out, numbering, and visually assessing the status of all the traditional heritage damaged buildings to identify the most endangered ones. You should change this, uh, the slides. Here is an example of the structural assessment, photos of the building damage, the architectural and structural inspection sheet, and the concept of the method statement and emergency intervention. It was the basis for the preparation of project documents for more than 100 buildings, which we were working on uh, by setting priorities. The 3D documentation and the photogrammetric survey were very helpful in detecting the damage as quickly as possible and finding the method statement for an urgent consolidation. Stages of, e of emergency consolidation of the buildings that we have, that we've seen previously. Next slides. In fact, with the help of contractor, we managed to consolidate it and cover it. Propping with volunteer contractors with no material funds, uh, as you can see in the slide. Um, next slides, next slides. Um, installation of the uh, to, uh, TOT corrugated sheets and tarpaulins to protect the buildings after repairing and consolidating the wooden beams of the roof. So today we are waiting for funds for them to be completely restored. Located on Goro Street at the intersection between Jemezi and Mar Mikhail, the Golan cluster is composed of five severely damaged heritage buildings after one year and a half of restoration, welcoming back nine families, 11 businesses, and more than 50 direct beneficiaries. Rehabilitation of heritage units with minor damages one of the priorities of this project was to safeguard our social fabric and save Lebanese heritage by restoring 
150 units affected by minor damage to allow families to return home as quickly as possible, which was successfully done. It took us eight months to do it, and the families were delighted to return to their homes. Uh, can you wrap up in two minutes, please? Thank you. Yes, we're in the last two slides. Implementation of a GIS platform where we are working on from day two of the explosion, the data itself is being updated frequently to match the evolution of the work on site. This is the initiative will be crucial for the future planning of the area, not just for the current disaster. And so sorry, I didn't uh, jump to this slide, which is a GIS platform. And you can see how uh, the uh, three buildings are being uh, documented on top in a 3D model, all being archived and recorded. And the rebuilding for the people uh, with the uh, so-called uh, um, uh, 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 on-the-job training, École Chantier, Chantier École, is one of the first professional efforts to preserve and rebuild Beirut's disappearing craftsmanship, which was launched uh, by the IECD uh, for seven young people who were trained, 13 young people on traditional carpentry and re rehabilitation, and 10 using traditional lime plastering. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Alia and Grace. I'm so sorry, Grace, you were not able to join because I'm of- I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for that because it's not, I don't have a good, I'm not, I don't know if you are, if you hear me now. Very well, we but, can. Uh, I can add that as well as we, we made yes. guidelines uh, uh, I want to add uh, as well that we have made guidelines manual tradition for traditional restorations. Uh, they may la la laid by uh, Beirut Heritage, Heritage Initiative. Sorry, and we're still working on heritage and everything is on the go and on the, the, the uh, sustainability and on uh, the same materials we were working on before, traditional ones. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me for my bad connection. No problem, Grace. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing all your slides and your text with uh, with Alia, so we could carry on without interruption. Really appreciate uh, both of you with, for such an interesting presentation. I think uh, what it also shows is that any human-induced event also needs to take into account uh, the opportunity to make changes for the better future. So how we can combine these together. Uh, is really something we have to take into account and this is a good food for thought for us uh, from your presentation. So thank you again to both of you. And now uh, I'm very happy to invite our last presenter and then we'll have our discussions to reflect later on. So our last uh, presenter is Francesca Peek uh, who is uh, going to be uh, presenting now uh, and she, her title is control and maintenance uh, for the sustainable conservation of built cultural heritage. So Francesca uh, is a wall paintings conservator trained at Cotplaw Institute of Art, University of London with a degree in chemistry and master's degree in science for conservation. She has worked from 91 to 2004 at the Getty Conservation Institute on several multidisciplinary projects focusing on conservation of immovable heritage, wall paintings, bas relief, mosaics, archaeological sites. Since 2009, she has also been employed as a teacher and researcher at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland and was nominated Professor of Science Applied to Conservation of Cultural Heritage and has been recently responsible for the conservation, uh, for the conservation, of Restor conservation Restoration Unit. So over to you, Francesca. Thank you so much. Please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, hello to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, very well, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to share our experiences and to hear all of you. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I like to tell you that I'm talking from Switzerland, from SUPSI, the University of Applied Sciences. Uh, of Southern Switzerland in Mendrisio. This is our new campus. You're all invited to come and visit us. And here, I'd like to introduce also my colleague, Jacinta Jean, who uh, is co-author to this uh, work, uh, to this presentation and on this research. 
So SUPSI is, uh, has a conservation restoration unit which focuses uh, on built cultural heritage, or as we call it, immovable heritage. And uh, this uh, underlines the fact that this kind of heritage, as we've heard, is exposed constantly to climatic condition. And more often, or rather always, uh, the factors such as humidity and temperature fluctuation, that is to say the climate, have a central role in the causes and the mechanisms of deterioration. And therefore, we have learned over time, and we heard about this today, that treatment is not sufficient, but that we need to engage in regular processes of control the conditions and perform maintenance operation. And this is the only solution that we can see to ensure preservation over time. We know that um, a lot has been written about maintenance um, several uh, over the years, but in fact, concrete applications are rare to find. And this is because maintenance is still an unclear concept. It's considered complicated, it's considered costly. Um, and therefore, um, we try to put some experience together. So in 2019, here at SUPSI, we organized a call conference called Voce alle Esperienze, so voice to practical experiences. And the speakers were really invited to show concrete examples of monitoring and maintenance over time. And in fact, they did show and confirm the advantages over time, that is to say over 10, 15 years, the advantages of having a well-developed control and maintenance plan. And here, uh, the conference was recorded. Most of the presentations are in Italian, but some are in English, and the link is here at the bottom of the page on our university website. Um, the lack of methodological guidelines that can be easily understood, shared by owners and professionals and put into practice seems to be one of the obstacles that uh, uh, stop regular maintenance to be part uh, of good practice in heritage management. And as SUPSI, we have been working in collaboration with the Office of Cultural Heritage of uh, the this and the Canton Ticino and uh, partner pro partners in Italy to uh, create these guidelines into an interreg project. From the methodological point of view, the what we follow is a step that goes through five, uh, uh, the circular step that goes through five phases, the background data, an assessment, a planning, an execution of implementation and an update of the program, going back into more background data, et cetera. And the first step is the development of a system that can collect such a like a medical record for the monument that we are studying that allows to collect data, organize it according to the parts. So it's very important to divide the exterior, so the land, the vegetation, the path, the sidewalks, the building itself, the interior decorated surfaces, and then immovable heritage that might be contained inside. And this information comes all together over time as the control and maintenance take place, as the different events um, are carried out over time to create what, we, what can be called a clinical record, cartella clinica for the object. This is something that has been developed a long time ago. It's just the implementation seems to be difficult. And here is Santa Maria degli Angeli, the beautiful tramezzo by Bernardino Luini here in Lugano, again, come and visit us. The background data needs to be collected, connected to the information that the Office of Cultural Heritage has. This is a shot of the office uh, uh, database that includes a lot of information about the object, the Cathedral of St. Lawrence, which is the monument I show you at the beginning. And uh, several information are here. 
regarding who made the history of conservation, also materials that have, have been used and that are part of the, of the object. The, this information needs to go into the uh, medical data sheet of the monument and needs to be managed by the owner of the uh, property of the heritage. The second phase is the assessment. And this is fundamental, fundamental in distinguishing uh, factors um, and type of the degradation. Of course, there's guideline, existing that, guidelines that guide how to do a condition assessment. But the important part is to be able to distinguish what kind of problem can be managed and controlled through monitoring and maintenance, and what instead requires a more in-depth study, a proper diagnostic investigation and develop a proper treatment. And this is where the trick is. And we have seen problems created by maintenance operation being done under the name of maintenance, but in fact being real intervention, not properly studied and developed. So what is the difference that a maintenance intervention, a maintenance operation follows a control, is also guided by what we see, but mainly consists of operations that are repeated over time and that are carefully planned. They're clearly planned. They're planned in terms of what kind of material and method needs to be used and where they should be done. So new features, new phenomena, need to be tackled from a diagnostic point of view and cannot run simply under maintenance. The assessment works through understanding the problem, assessing the risk. And in this term, of course, we're using the wonderful work by ECROM, the ABC method, to develop risk summary sentences. These are fundamental in planning what control and maintenance needs to be done. And there are phrases such as the one I'm showing you here that clearly identify the agent of deterioration reported in, in red, for example, a block drain pipe or drainage system, the adverse effect, the problem that I may see, and in green, which is reported in, in uh, black, and in green instead, the part of the heritage that is affected. And here are some examples, three phrases that uh, exemplify such as risk summary sentences that um, are described very well in the ABC method, which all knows, and here's the link at the bottom of the page. Through this risk summary, which uh, sentences, which we create in the assessment, we move into the planning. So the planning of the control and maintenance program should indicate what are the parts that need control, how we should control them, how frequently, what are the operations that needs to be done, and most importantly, what is the estimated cost? Because any owners, any manager of site needs to have that part, which is always the first thing your boss will ask you. So through these risk phrases, we create, we have a relatively simple Excel uh, sheets that report uh, in this column, the risk with this color coded uh, symbols, the planned operation. So what should, control, should be controlled, the maintenance operation, maintenance operation that may be developed according to the condition assessment. So what I'm finding during my evaluation can indicate new requirements for uh, um, control and maintenance. And then there's possibility of comments, the frequency, how often I think this kind of control should be done. These are all things that get changed. Who, the professional that should carry out this uh, control. And Francesca, if you can conclude in two minutes. Sorry. Yes, Did I'm there. Ask? And finally, the cost. So this allowed to make maintenance contract. This allowed to plan for the execution, which again is reported in a similarly correlated table and will uh, allow to start with control and maintenance, which of course at the beginning will be hard. There will be a lot of work. Every time is implemented is an opportunity to revise the plan and update it. 
and to improve in the cost analysis. So the final, uh, the ongoing protocol is developed through a big sheet which uh, gives a plan over the years and allows also for managers to request funds. In our case, in the Ticino Canton, the government provides some funds if you ask for maintenance over a period of years. So this is very important also to share with the owners. So I'm really concluding here that this kind of intervention allow us also to identify priorities. So when funds are available, what to work on first, and the importance to try to keep the same expertise to do the control that get adjusted and used to what they're looking at. And finally, what we showed here is a process that attempts to provide operational guidelines to set up this control and maintenance uh, program, aiming at reducing the risk to heritage and ensure the stability over time. With the inevitable change in climate control and maintenance are more important than ever. And as SUPSI, in addition to this research project that I briefly um, illustrate, we try to promote this also through education so that the future professional involved with conservation are clearly aware of the importance of these practices and are capable to plan and implement them. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. I think you uh, really highlighted the importance of maintenance and this risk-based approach is really fundamental to anticipate what we may have in the future and take proactive actions. And I think that's the first step for us to move towards adaptation. So I think you have been uh, explaining it in a very systematic way through a methodology that you have developed at your institute through your research. And, uh, and uh, so thank you again for sharing it with uh, all of us. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So now we have concluded all these four very interesting presentations and I would uh, now request our discussants to reflect on them and also share their own views. And uh, first discussant, I'm very pleased to invite uh, Professor May Kasser. Uh, May Kasser is the director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage, which she in fact established in 2001. Uh, she holds the number of public offices including membership of the Science Advisory Council of the UK Government's Department of Culture, Media and Support, uh, Sport and its Advisory Board for the Culture and Heritage Capital Programme. For the last 20 years, May has been involved in heritage science and policy research and development focusing on cultural heritage and climate change impacts. She is a member of the Scientific Steering Committee of the IPCC Ecomos UNESCO International Co-Sponsored Meeting on Culture, Heritage and Climate Change and of the Scientific Advisory Board of the JPI Cultural Heritage and a member of its joint working group uh, uh, who has been also working on white paper on culture and climate. So with so much experience and knowledge, I'm so privileged that May is here to share her reflections with us. So over to you, May. Uh, can you uh, unmute yourself? Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I would like to thank ICROM, uh, DCMS and the British Council for inviting me to this panel. And firstly, I would like to congratulate all the presenters for their stimulating and complimentary contributions, which I cannot believe is accidental. This looks like very well planned. So congratulations. The aim of this session has been to explore current understandings and approaches and to explore focus areas where more work is needed. I'd like to start with a general point and then to highlight some focus areas where more work might be needed. Our understanding of bioclimatic principles, the interaction with buildings, with climate in mind is patchy in the West and certainly stronger among traditional cultures. It is less prevalent in more industrialized societies where technology is often perceived as the solution. Bioclimatic principles and design are rich in societies 
where buildings are intimately connected with the earth and the environment that surrounds them. One focus area that could do with more attention is the inter-regional exchanges on bioclimatic principles. Another focus area could be matching places with emerging climate change trends with places where these climate change conditions are already established. For example, what bioclimatic principles could be applied and what lessons can be learned from vernacular architecture by places who for the first time are facing desertification. I'll turn my attention briefly to the excellent presentations we have listened to. The presentation on learning from heritage for better resilience with its focus on building with the local climate in mind suggests the importance of a cross-disciplinary socio-technical approach for successful building with climate. By putting culture at the heart of building, we identify the potential of local knowledge to inform adaptation in fragile and changing environments. Communities do not want things done for them or to them, but with them, even when our efforts are well-intentioned. To understand what must be kept and what must be adapted, we need to understand both the adaptive capacity for change and the adaptive potential to enhance resilience. Another potential focus area where more work might be needed is how we connect formal study, including, for example, scholarly research with local practices. How can we strengthen our learning from ancient cultures, archaeology and vernacular architecture that was so ably presented in the first presentation to better inform post-recovery, post-disaster recovery in the industrialized West, as well as in more traditional cultures. The presentation on environmental adaptation and socio-cultural mitigation approaches in built form and occupational patterns, lessons learned from the vernacular Red Sea architecture of Suakin in Sudan, placed bioclimatic design at the heart of built heritage and climate adaptation, and which gives the built environment its specialness. From building clusters to building form to building finishes, the case studies in this presentation are rich in examples of climatic adaptation, which in fact create local distinctiveness. Another possible focus area is to extend the concept of climatic typologies of building heritage in order to pave the way towards a more holistic assessment of the built environment, as has already been suggested and hinted at by our chairman. The presentation on Beirut's built heritage after the explosion of August the 4th, 2020, is a powerful case study in its own right, and also for the lessons that can be mobilized should another disaster of similar proportions occurs. It also brings to mind the anthropogenic human-induced climate change impacts anywhere and also in Beirut, such as, for example, sea level rises and its impact on many coastal areas. One area of focus where perhaps more work is needed is for the future is how, in the midst of a disaster, climate change resilience can be built into every element of disaster recovery. How can we look at every disaster response through a climate impacts lens as well and think how we can rebuild for resilience? And thinking about disasters more broadly with the Levant fault in mind, how 
do we also mitigate earthquake risks and possible tsunamis? Another potential focus is how we extend the cross-disciplinary response to disasters, whether man-made, anthropogenic, or natural. The presentation on control and maintenance for the sustainable conservation of built cultural heritage asks what potential climate change impacts can be addressed with maintenance, making the very persuasive point that maintenance builds resilience to climate change over time. I had suggested earlier that we should use the climate change as the lens. I would now also like to suggest that we make climate resilience explicit in everything we do. Conservation implicitly is about climate. Now we need to put climate resilience at the front and center of all our activities. A potential focus area for further study might be to grasp consistently thorny issues, such as how do we preserve and yet increase capacity and resilience to climate change? And maybe maintenance could provide us with a key. A final point to conclude is always to remind ourselves and each other that once in a while, we should step back and look at the a bigger picture, look at the context and look at all the risks that might be impacting on our built heritage. Thank you. Thank you so much, May, for such, uh, in a such clear way summarizing all these discussions and also putting forward an agenda for future, which I think is so important for us. All these presentations should not be just an end in themselves. They should provoke us to plan for a better future more in terms of research and practice. So you have very clearly laid down uh, goals for us to think about. And I completely agree with you that we don't need to think about climate change or climate adaptation in isolation. This is, has to be integrated in the larger thinking. And that is so key because more and more we have been focusing on climate change as an issue, but it cannot sit in a silo. It has to be really mainstreamed in our larger discourse. So thank you so much for putting it out for us to think and reflect so clearly. Thank you again. And now I'm very, very pleased to invite uh, Ms. Fatma Twahid, who has been, who is going to, who is our, another discussant and has been kind enough to share her thoughts with us. Uh, Ms. Fatma is the principal curator of Fort Jesus World Heritage Site in Kenya. She holds a bachelor's degree in architecture and MSc in environmental engineering. Uh, Fatma is also an accomplished lead environmental expert registered by the National Environmental Management Authority of Kenya and a trained conservationist in built heritage and disaster risk management. Padma has worked on various positions as site manager and heritage professional, and I'm sure we are gonna really uh, also hear many interesting points from her, and I'm expecting she's gonna really speak from her African and local context. So Padma, over to you. Thank you very much, Rohit. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly and see the very well. screen. Thank you very much, yes. Thank you. Uh, it's very hard to add on to what uh, has already been discussed, but I'll try and uh, shed a few uh, perspectives from, from my understanding. Um, from uh, an assessment of uh, the uh, vernacular architecture perspective, we see that um, heritage can teach us a lot with reference to uh, looking at uh, the local materials, and um, uh, the space layout and the, the intangible component in, in, in addressing environmental issues. Um, uh, briefly looking at uh, the next presentation uh, of uh, Suakin, uh, we further address the societal beliefs and uh, how they are reflected in the vernacular architecture, their, their ways of life, and uh, how they define the identity of the, the kind of architecture that's presented uh, in, in Sudan. Um, further on, 
when we look at uh, Beirut, uh, we see the critical need for um, going through uh, documenting and understanding what was existing using different technological means so that um, what is uh, uh, put out uh, in terms of uh, creating, trying to recreate what has been destroyed is very close to what the original is. And in the process, uh, we create an opportunity for which the community can be involved in and they can uh, present their local expertise and uh, others can, can learn out of it in the process. Um, with uh, uh, the case uh, from Francesca, uh, I, th I think what is uh, what I'm getting from all this is that logical sequence in which one needs to go through the entire process uh, critically so that you can um, try and capture different aspects of, of, of uh, heritage management in order not to lose out on any important concepts. Now, when you reflect back to what we have been experiencing here in Kenya, um, the, the cost of Kenya is uh, um, dotted with uh, around more than 60 heritage sites. And they are as, as, as a result of uh, 15th and to 13th to 15th century maritime trade. That means there's a vast array of different types of heritage, uh, starting from uh, city states that, uh, for example, Lam World Heritage Sites, down to uh, trading centers or slave uh, uh, trading uh, facilities all al uh, along the coast. Different types of heritage uh, represented along, uh, along the coast. Now, what is critical is that uh, with their coastal position is that uh, we, they experience a lot of climate change impacts that result from increased temperatures, sea erosion, and uh, coastal storms and rainfalls. Now, uh, I want to present a few examples on how we have managed to deal with uh, coping with such challenges. One example is for Jesus World Heritage Site that is seen here before an intervention. There was uh, a lot of uh, sea erosion experienced here, and it was uh, risking the stability of the base of the fort. Uh, in this case, there was an engineering intervention, uh, totally modern and totally uh, based on the, the assessment of the sea, sea force. But uh, before this was done, of course, there was an environmental impact assessment and heritage impact assessment, allowing for not just the assessment of the values and the technology to be uh, implemented, but the community uh, participation aspect in which the beliefs and practices of the people can be incorporated in implementing such a project. What we see as a result is that we have uh, come up with uh, um, a landscape space that has been brought about from the uh, restoration uh, of that sea, sea wall and that this space would be used by the community for very, various um, flexible uh, social functions. Another example is uh, Vasco da Gama pillar, which is uh, in Malindi. This is a navigation pillar of the uh, late 15th century. Again, experiencing sea erosion. And in this case, there was a different uh, solution for it. And again, similarly, impact assessments and community involvement, community benefit, community awareness and training and education as a result. Differently from this is the CU fort that was built um, later in time in the 1880s by the local community. And um, this uh, maybe as a result of, uh, of having less er erosion, though there is uh, an impact of water intrusion into the, the site, the, the, the approach was to work with the local masons using local materials reinforced, however, you with um, galvanized uh, wire so that they can build a protection wall that will res restrict the, the sea from uh, um, affecting the, the heritage space. This was what came out of it. And this was with the use of the local masons, their local expertise, local materials, uh, working together with the community members as they are training and learning as was seen in the Beirut case. 
I, uh, what, what I can also highlight that what we see in Kenya is that the need for us to increase capacity of the heritage managers in coping with, with uh, matters of climate change, in coming up with adaptation strategies and creating resilience of our heritage along the coast. We have had several uh, cases of, uh, for example, uh, climate action disaster risk management that was funded by the British Council Protection Fund. Uh, we've also had uh, a privilege to be trained in climate vulnerability index and uh, an uh, effective management tool that also focuses on not just management of the heritage, but social, economic and environmental matters that need to be considered when managing your heritage. Uh, what is key and critical that is translated through other case studies down also to what we're experiencing in, at, at our local level is the need to coordinate with other stakeholders that play a role towards um, the issue of climate change. Climate change is not local, it's regional, and the need for which to involve the community at large so that they can benefit from the heritage and so that they, we can learn from their uh, uh, historical expertise and that we can train the youth that are there so that they can translate this historical knowledge down to the next generation. What, uh, what I'm showing over here is uh, one of those uh, capacity building pro uh, programs in which uh, we were working with the community members to try and get them to explain to us um, their, the scenarios, their risk scenarios that came about from, from the sites and how they have managed to deal with them in the past. And as a result, come up with a risk management plan for different sites. So these capacity building uh, programs did not just um, empower the heritage managers, but they have also um, assisted the local communities to emulate a logical sequence of coming up with a solution to a problem, like looking at the values and attributes and see which is your focus of operation, risk analysis, planning, execution, as seen in, in the Beirut case. And then, uh, not just uh, that logical sequence, we see as a result of these capacity building programs, uh, when we're working with case studies, uh, um, proper documentation of the sites that are in question. So now we have uh, uh, not all of the 60 sites, maybe five to 10 of them that have been properly documented so that the baseline has been captured in the event of any climate change impact, we know how to get it back to the original or maybe even build better. Uh, uh, most importantly is that the capacity building programs have also assisted us to come up with disaster risk management plans. So planning and maintenance of our heritage it is not as uh, business as usual, but now we are considering uh, including the aspect of risk management uh, that uh, brought about from um, uh, climate change uh, disasters. Mm. Over and above everything is uh, uh, these programs have highlighted the, the list of stakeholders that play different roles. Um, we have had uh, a list, uh, uh, not just the names of the different institutions that play a role in emergency response and restoration, but uh, their contacts, how to reach them, how to reorganize with the heritage, with the community, how do we work together and, and get this heritage uh, protected during a um, disasters or uh, climate change uh, occurrences. Uh, most, uh, last but not least is the, the component of community empowerment. Um, nothing, uh, heritage cannot exist in isolation. We need the, the, the strength of the community in their expertise and in their numbers so that we can work together in um, creating uh, greater uh, response and resilience to the heritage. So um, using these um, capacity building programs, we have managed to organize community members in registered groups, and we have also managed to um, train them and get them organized so that they are a known group in which one can call upon in the event of uh, building up or working together towards uh, heritage uh, rehabilitation. What you see in these pictures is a stakeholder awareness, uh, stakeholder consultation in which we are introducing these community groups to them so that they can work hand in hand in different um, 
in different uh, restoration activities. Uh, we have also managed uh, to work with the stakeholders in which with the discussion of, with the community members, uh, they have highlighted the kind of plants that can be uh, put up along the, the sea frontage that will allow for reduced uh, wave action on the heritage. So working with the community groups and experts from uh, different organizations, we are working towards coming up with not just complex solutions towards uh, adaptation to environment, but also uh, softer solutions to reduce the impact of heritage or impact of climate change on heritage. Uh, here we are showing how the training has also been impacted on the community in that they are not, not just emergency responders to heritage, but they can also deal with um, first aid and firefighting issues and, and that they are well equipped to handle other matters within the society through uh, the heritage tool in which they were trained in. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think your presentation really highlighted a few very important points which I think should be factored in when we talk about built heritage and climate adaptation. I think the important role of community, the important role of uh, capacity building uh, is really what you highlighted and showed. Uh, it's not just talking about it but actually showing it at the local level is something that we all have to kind of look at. This last mile has to be really taken into account otherwise all these discourses will be up in the air maybe or maybe will li be limited to uh, laboratories but we have to take them all out to make a difference on the ground and I think you have shown it very very clearly so thank you again. Uh, now we are coming to the end of this uh, panel, but before I close, there is one question for a presenter and, and then uh, I have also a very quick uh, point for uh, the other three presenters. Uh, so for Francesca, there is a question for you. I trust maintenance costs, maintenance may be less costly in the long term than big conservation works every 30 to 50 years. Is this the case? Um, so she's asking you. Uh, Marielle is asking you this question. Yeah, yes, e e exactly. Um, I confirm this. And as I was saying, some of the presentation that we had at this conference showed exactly that. And um, basically, over a period of 50, 60 years, uh, monuments, and we're talking especially stone uh, objects that are exposed to the exterior, and they are regularly, say every five, seven year looked at, perhaps small conservation intervention are carried out to consolidate, to close entrance of water. So simple operation that are, as I said in that presentation, they, they are planned, we already, already was developed, what kind of material should be used? Um, what kind of phenomena should be treated? So these simple operation over time, can save the object. The otherwise, we all know that deterioration is goes on exponentially in a way. So once a fracture is created, then water can enter, then we can have other problems, freeze and thaw, salts issues. So it's very important, especially the control of water, which needs to be done regularly. Just one last comment is that these examples are really related to small communities often. So say a church that uh, has a, um, a organizational com community that really takes care of it and understand and is able to manage the intervention and the uh, contract. So to call back the conservator in this case, uh, stone conservators call back regularly and be, trust this person because one big issue is that, you know, a conservator always is looking for a job. So you don't want to do work when it's not necessary. So it's very important also to be clear uh, in what you, you in expressing the needs of the object. So yes, uh, it's um, thank you very much, Francesca. Studies. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. So a very quick question to Thierry and David uh, from your experience. Uh, and you rightly said that we need to take uh, vernacular heritage to the new. You know, how do you learn from that? And then how do you incorporate them in the way we do new constructions? 
uh, what do you think is the main hurdle that we have to cross? Because often we find it is very difficult for people to get convinced that cultural heritage or the knowledge of traditional materials and constructions can have relevance uh, in the new uh, contemporary construction as well or the new construction. So how do you think we can bridge this kind of challenge? How can we address this if you can reflect on that very briefly? But it's, it's a constant challenge in the work we are doing. Uh, but the on, only solution we have found is to manage to, to at least make a sample. So the, the first prototype is often very important. Uh, so the, the issue is to convince that, well, if there are some discussions on which option should, should be selected for a project, uh, what is important is to be able to pass this stage of a prototype. Then people can come, can touch, uh, uh, can see, and uh, they look at the cause, they look at the advantages. So, so they, uh, and then it's a discussion. What is important is that you should include some improvement. That means you, you need to find a way. Uh, there was a discussion this morning uh, in, in, my, in another panel, which I was, uh, <clears throat> in which I was uh, on, on uh, presentation by Ikram on decolonization. But there's also uh, mentalities that things modern, th things coming from abroad are better. But somehow we see when, when there are some hazards that often these better things are, 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 not, uh, are not suited to the local situations when in the traditions there were solutions. So it's, it's kind of uh, looking at how we can revive this pride within the, the people, within the communities, and that also, and, and, and the simplest way is, is, is a demonstration. And, and what happened in, in IT, which is, is a recent project, which is extremely successful with huge uh, developments uh, currently after the second uh, uh, <clears throat> seismic event, which happened last August. Uh, is, uh, what was I, I was saying <laughs> is that, um, well, we, the, the beginning was, was really difficult, but gradually things went on. And, and the events which passed over the, the island made also the, 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 the proof that what we were pro proposing was uh, working in the, in the local situations. And, and now uh, Asian themselves, professional Asians are defending the idea and they are promoting it by themselves. So it's, we are still continuing to do some work because we feel that there's needs for uh, doing things uh, valet by valet because the traditions are a bit different and the conditions are a bit different. So we try to, to push attention to people. The resources are, are also uh, different, but people are taking it by themselves. But it's a long process. You, you need to have time to do that. So it's not something that you do in, in one day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think this prototype of my point that you made is, is really key. Now, uh, very quickly, I would like to go back to Ali. Uh, David, you want to say something? Please. Yeah, very short, just a yes. key word. It is training, it is a training issue. Yes. You once would be surprised to realize how uh, students in the schools of architecture are not aware at all about, yes. about this question of vernacular architecture. Absolutely. And uh, mm -hmm. there is something to do here uh, at, at this level, at the roots, training, training, training architects. Very true. I mean, I, from my own architecture education, I didn't learn about how do you construct in stone or it was much later that I realized how important it is. So thank you so much. Uh, May is leaving us. So May, thank you very much for joining us. And I will have last uh, kind of intervention from Ali and Grace. Uh, if, uh, if you can just very quickly tell us from your strong work in uh, Lebanon after this unfortunate blast, uh, how do you think uh, this issue that how have you involved community in this whole process have you have you found them kind of helping you working with you or is that have there been any hurdles in that if you can quickly say something on that so if i can i i don't know if you can yes yes we can so from my side basically uh being also a volunteer in the lebanon mountain trail uh, working with 76 villages along a 470 kilometer long distance hiking trail, protecting and preserving all the heritage along that trail. We have gained a lot of experience in understanding what it involves when you work with communities. 
And in the Beirut case specifically, because uh, the, the trail is in the mountains, Beirut citizens are very diverse. So it makes it more difficult specifically in the damaged areas uh, around the blast where, where um, architect restorers and volunteers, ar archeologists as well, had to be confronted with tra traumatized inhabitants, uh, number one. Number two, inhabitants who refused to uh, return to their houses. So how do you create a sense of attachment when this or that person suddenly lost the, uh, the hope, is not interested? So we're talking about uh, first, trying to overcome traumatized situations, and second, talking to the people and telling them, well, um, a calamity like that, of that size, which is man-made, versus any climatic issues which the houses themselves um, promote. In that sense, these are uh, climate resilient structures and that is why we would like to preserve them. They are much more uh, um, eco-friendly in that sense than uh, a 200 uh, meter tall uh, concrete uh, skyscraper. And so there's the big issue, working bottoms up versus what happened. That's why I gave this overview in Beirut from top to bottom, when 30 years ago, the decisions in Beirut were not taking the local community. Thank you very much, Alia. Thank you for this very important reflection. So very quickly, Obeid, if you are around, are you there? Uh, Sorry? Obeid is there? No, he's maybe he's not around. OK, I think uh, if Obeid is not around, our second presenter. Hello? Yes, Obeid. OK, uh, he's around. Yeah. I want to ask you a question. Uh, what you, you presented vernacular heritage, no? And you showed us how climate adaptation is really an important part of that. Uh, how do you think uh, in 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 your in Sudan in the new constructions has there been any kind of a, a knowledge uh, transfer from this vernacular construction, or is it completely uh, ignored? How is the situation today, and what do you think can be done from the level of uh, as an academic uh, research and from research to practice, how can we bridge this gap? Okay, the current situation right now, uh, there are too many preservation schemes have been developed or has been conceptualized for developing or uh, uh, developing the, the, the culture uh, of, the, of Sawakin. But uh, they, oh, they, they just focused on the legal aspect uh, without any regard to the a philosophical part of the uh, space syntax, uh, the variety of allocation and the materials that they, they were used at that time. So it just focuses on the legal aspect. And also there, there were some preservation schemes uh, coming from Turkish uh, municipalities and such kind of uh, uh, foreign uh, government to, as a matter of investment and also to impose one of the styles rather than the whole, rather than just looking at the hygienic architectural style that was formulated in Sawakin. So uh, mainly if we just uh, collaborated, for example, with the Turkish uh, uh, government, they will just focusing on the Othman style uh, manifestation emerged in the architecture of Sawakin uh, without any regard to the others. So my advice on that part that we should uh, focus uh, on the capacity building, focus on the scholarly work, focus on the uh, generative uh, projects uh, to come with some protocols so we can ensure that uh, whatever the, 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 the times on the, we are going or funding uh, that will develop such kind of a scheme, we, uh, we really need to ensure that they need to take all of these uh, specialness as a whole not just uh, to fragment, uh, to, to use it uh, in a fragmented way or in isolation with other uh, emerged style. That's a very important point you are making, Obeid. I think this importance of really looking at the whole is, is so crucial and often we kind of uh, overlook them. So thank you very much for give, making up this point. So I'm uh, now uh, supposed to end this panel. Uh, it has been a very, very exciting, uh, stimulating set of presentations from all of you and reflections from our discussants and also these in interesting questions to, to really think about um, and uh, act is so much there. So I would like to just conclude this panel with four...
important point. Excuse me, excuse me, Roy. I yes. want to as add something. Uh, yes. That I, yes. Uh, I want to say that now it yes. it's, it was and it's still one of our main concern to collaborate with the community and inhabitants who are working now with uh, all the NGOs, with all the associations, with all the people under on the ground, with all with all in. Uh, the inhabitants to to try to found solutions and uh, to take advantage from this uh, uh, big uh, damage uh, that we uh, had lived with shock that we had lived to go forward to better and uh, uh, solutions great thank ground. you very much yeah no that, i think that's that's important and and i hope and i wish that you continue uh, and be successful in this important initiative, Grace, uh, that you are doing. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, I would just like to conclude by making four important points, uh, which I have captured through these presentations. I think the importance of linking research and practice is very critical. Whatever research we do, how we take it back to practice, and whatever experience we are gathering in the field has to be also brought back to research. Uh, the second important point I wanted to make was the link between the macro level and the micro level. Though we talk a lot about the global uh, initiatives and global work, uh, we need to take it down to the local level. And we have seen very many examples where we work with local stakeholders to make this more practical, grounded. And that's another important link we must establish. The third important point I've captured is about the need for a holistic view. Uh, which is embedding climate science into all the other risks, all the other considerations is so key. So we cannot look at climate adaptation in sep separately. And lastly, I feel the importance of uh, really uh, innovating and adapting traditional knowledge to really look at traditional knowledge, not as just something to be archived or looked at in a more uh, static way, but really using it and adapting it in the current contemporary context is so much cu crucial for really ensuring that climate adaptation is an important part of our built heritage protection and conservation. So thank you very much to all of you for being with us for this uh, panel and I'm uh, now saying goodbye to all of you. Bye bye. Take care and enjoy thank the you. other sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rohit. So uh, much. I will just put the link as well in the chat for the next sessions to everyone. And then also, uh, while we're all still here, we have Ms. Noro Rabo Abahi with us today, who will be sharing um, a case study. So if anyone wants to hang around, please do for 10 minutes. And then um, I invite Ms. Noro to turn on her camera. Uh, hi, I'll just briefly introduce her as well. So Ms. Noah, is, uh, um, we're very pleased that she's here to join us. She's here from uh, Madagascar. Well, she's living in Paris, but is from Madagascar. And she will present her case study, Small Insular Territories, Landmarks of Climate Change. Um, Ms. Noah has worked on flooding and cyclonal areas during monsoons and conducted a survey on vernacular earth building, below cost housing and urban and recent agriculture. And I can't really pronounce this very well, but Antona Navarivo. Uh, so I invite her to please, uh, yes, share her case study. I didn't see uh, the first half of this panel, but from what I did see, I believe it also con connects very well to the presentations that preceded. All right, thank you. You may have to uh, begin, thank you. Is it okay? Yes, we can see everything and it's full screen. The full screen is okay? Yes, the it looks great. Okay. Microphone too? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, everybody. Good evening to all from whatever latitude you are. I'm sorry, but I'm not fluent in English and I prefer to read. It will be better. I am very honored to have the opportunity to present to you my case today. In this case, I would like to underline the environmental situation of, of all the small islands in the globe, small islands that we cannot distinguish at first glance when we open Google Earth and which require a very large zoom on these very tiny territories. I am obviously thinking of all those who have preceded me over the last many decades and who are tirelessly pursuing 
to their the precious approach of informing the world population and have testified through their own small island in the vanguard of global warming that affect us all. My case study is a little contribution to the ongoing work on public benefit to humanity. The fact is that very small islands are the first indicators of climate change. The emergency is growing self-imposed. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here we, here we are. This is, I'm sorry. Yeah, though for the, the theme, the futures we write for climate, culture and peace, utopias or dystopias. Then I'm going to read the dictionary definition defines dystopia as an imaginary society governed by totalitarian power or nefarious ideology as conceived by a given author. And the definition of utopia is an ideal but imaginary society such as conceived and described it a given author. In second definition, utopia is a project whose realization is impossible. Example, a world without violence is impossible. And in the third definition, utopia describes the functioning of an ideal society, which one assumes exists in a generally closed place, such as city or an island. Thus, in the case presented here, I consider that the angles of the earth represent totalitarian power to define dystopia. And in this part, this first part, I will return the second definition of utopia, which sets the example of a world without violence. In this third slide, here we can see the migratory flow from island to island. This is another perception of the world. This world view reminds us that our planet is a land of water. World is everlasting evolving, but its depiction still the usual planisphere with the opposition between United States and Russia. In order to present another ge geographical in keeping to the studies things, it needs to expose a different way of processing data relating to natural hazards geography. Therefore, expanding another singular conception of the world for from Pivotal Zone, Indonesia, of Indonesia and Indian Ocean. More appropriate, defining Indian, Indonesia as center, central axis, one of the most seismic regions worldwide. Indonesia also symbolizes the starting point of many Malayo-Polynesian migrations extending to the east towards New Zealand, here, to Hawaiian islands for the North Pacific, Indonesia for Hawaii, and to the west in India Ocean to Mayotte and Madagascar, by this way, along the coast. Um, yeah. On the second map, we can see On the second map, you can see main tectonics, the orange action here. You can see here, for example, represents the global geography of Earth building and the white action like this under the sea with the, the green flesh. Um, we can see the orange action represents the global geography of the region and the what I changed the map of the extreme winds and rainstorms. On this map, I use them, it's a zoom. And I would like to explain here that when you open Google Earth, you can't see here Mayotte. You can't defend Ile de la Réunion, but you can see Madagascar here. Then, Mayotte and Indola La Réunion are volcanic topology and French departments. Or Madagascar is not a volcanic topology, it's a francophone territory that results from the 
plate tectonics. You can see here on this way a fault seismic or seismic fault, which could uh, read the Davy. And in this map, I voluntarily enlarged the small island to, sign to signify really the, the reality of the very, very small island. And um, thus in Mayotte, we've got a mix, like in every island of the world, we've got a mixed culture resource from various migrations over time. South Arabian, Persian, Bantu, Malayo Polynesian, and Austronesian origins. But this linguistic cultural with paradoxically coupled with high rate of illiteracy complicates risk prevention. This plurilingual socio linguistic future requires introduction of prevention that can be appropriate by everyone. Think with nature and local society to maximize survival protection by setting up natural culture of disaster, to grasp impacts assessment and manage efficiently the entire cycle of disaster, then pre-disaster period, impacts and post-disaster period. Yeah. Oh. Here we go. I'm going to share another part, this one. Uh, no, I think. No, no, no. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll let you a few seconds, I think. Is it a video? I have to. Well, it's, it's an interactive map, and I would like to show the oh. all over the world to explain. If I escape, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I did it. Maybe we we oh. can share the link later in the chat, or we yeah. can uh, share it yeah. online, and then people can use it. I'm thinking. Well, it doesn't work well. Um, well, uh, you can see with the line, the blue line. This is the volcanic um, volcanic activity. Here you can see here. Uh, Madagascar and uh, uh, Tartala volcano in the, the archipelago of um, Comoros and here the Piton de la Fournaise uh, of the Ile de la Réunion. But there is another one, a new one, um, at 50 kilometers from the coast, east coast of uh, Mayotte, which has, was born in uh, 2015, yes, in 2015. And um, here, I would like to focus on volcanic activity across the globe. And I will be back to this activity, volcanic activity later. Here you can see then Mayotte and its singular lagoon exceeding 1,000 kilometers square and the coral reef entirely surrounding the island. Yeah. This exceptional seat has applied for UNESCO World Heritage Listing. It is ongoing. I don't have any more information about it. This case study exposes the environmental evolution of Mayotte between 2010 and 2022. It frames the topicality emerging phenomena context due to geological risks and rising sea level. Mayotte, volcanic typology, and oldest archipelago's emerged island, compound of 17 municipalities, expresses worldwide environmental reality of small insular territories. The island is entirely subject to natural risks prevention plans with regard to construction. In 2010, land use plans and building projects are subject to building disaster protection standards then land use planning and construction professionals have to deal with all recognized natural hazards. In, 2002, in 2022, usual events are getting worse with huge damage expansion, with expanding new natural disaster and new shifts in population. 
paying attention on natural disaster development allows transposition of occurrences models, but does not allow to assert an identical reproduction following climate change. Mitigation has been becoming increasingly complex for the island world. Then I was talking about um, the new volcano. I'm not sure, I don't know why exactly, because due to this, maybe it will be more by this way, but due to the scale of the map of Google Earth, then the, the essential is to know that a new volcano has, was born. And then um, a very long seismo, seismo volcanic period from May 2018 to today is going really worse. Um, and then the right to volcanoes activity with the new volcano 50 kilometers from the east coast of the island, Mayotte undergoes earthquakes of medium magnitude of the Richter scale, but the unexpected lies in its very long duration of realization since May 2018 until today. Faced with rising sea levels and the erosion of the global coastline, coastline urbanization is becoming impossible. The solution is to pull over urbanization inland, but it only holds for mainland. The fact is that the uniqueness of small islands lies in its physical limitations quickly restrict withdrawal urbanization inland. The decline of urbanization inland does not apply to insular world. Here you can see this is a recent um, photographies. And you can see here the coastal zone of Mayotte is very densely populated and particularly vulnerable to hazards such as cyclone, erosion, landslide, and flooding associated with marine fluid. The coast is not a stable zone, but is naturally mobile and coastal risks exist independently of climate change. But the impact the sector where plants pressure is the strongest and which turns out to be the privileged place of the most concentrated human actions and in the dense places the soil is heavily eroded. And thus nowadays we can see the setting up of the lagoon while the young French department has just come into the monsoon or ever hurricane season which is getting longer with global warming. And the aggregation of these emerging risks added to existing natural risks are getting worse. In 2021, Mayotte is declared in state of disaster by French government. In conclusion, the futures to right resenting of this case today are dystopia scenario would be to see the Mozambique Channel region disappear an expanding area would collapse in a few minutes, nothing more. The utopia for climate, for prevention, scientific research throughout the world has shown that nature provides us with animal references that erode the imminent occurrence of a major risk, such as geological risk. The behavior of animals before disappearing to flee danger and which return after disaster realized could be a cheap and so simple alarm system. For example, snakes for earthquake in Japan, goats, dogs, and cats in Italy, the disappearance of sharks in the Indian Ocean for tsunami, etc. The objective is to integrate multi-risk education with preventing and examining in future. It's for now and for, for the benefit of society that does not have the means to afford advanced technology. Utopia for culture, for specifically, specifically for earth building and environment. It will be to collect mud from the bottom of the lagoon and then reuse coastal siltation soil to provide building materials by recycling shame for circular economy and green job and green job creation. 
We must apprehend building back better, copying with frugal architectural multi risk approach for shanty town inhabitants, establishment of the constantly growing migratory flow. And to end, the utopia for peace. Climatic migration is not chosen migration. Therefore, to keep the population there and avoid many conflicts, one of the strategic responses to this environmental disaster would be to help the local population to stay on pace. And above all, and to conclude, the priority remains the conservation of our most beautiful heritage, the Earth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Moreau. I really liked how you brought together the, um, the, the theme from the workshop. I don't think we've seen that in the conference before, but I thought it was a really interesting frame that you gave. And I'll keep it to one question so that you can also go join the workshop. Um, so you were looking at the, um, the, the utopia, dystopia uh, vision for the future. And then the illustrations were also really helpful um, in showing what the current risks are. So I was, it's a bit of a uh, you know, big question maybe, but if you were to represent your utopia on a map, or actually, no, let me rephrase, sorry. Um, so you were showing us on Google Earth um, the, the Mayotte and Madagascar, but you had on the side the, the risks that they're experiencing. Do you think it'd be, yes, that'd be helpful, thank you. Yes. Okay. I was wondering, do you think it would be helpful if um, a platform like Google Earth had these natural hazards on Google Earth as well? This one? The... Um, to some yeah, so like... the very long seismal uh, volcanic period, I put this pictogram here. Yeah. But this, uh, you asked me if this is on Google Earth that I keep. I kept this. No, I was asking, should Google Earth have these hazards? No. No? I'm okay. sure that I'm just... Um, maybe I'll rephrase it. Um, if you could design Google Earth, if you could choose, would you put these hazards on Google Earth? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, it would be, I think it would be better to Add a, a plugin, a plugin, is it? A plugin, yeah. and uh, to be able to to inform and to design effectively for all the globe, the the hazards, natural hazards for each area of the globe. That will yes, be but... really helpful, but also for small islands. That's uh, the really concentrated hazards. Yes. I can imagine. Yes. So then I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. And I'm sorry for the delay in that. Then uh, okay. people went to the next session. And then we will also, to those still with us and to those watching the recording later, Ms. Noro's case study will also be shared on the website later. So everyone can go read it in depth. So thank you so much to everyone. And uh, have a good day and enjoy the next sessions as well. Thank you. <laughs>